All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Professor Nardi, the ex-phys guy here. Um, today we're going to be talking about the YMCA bite test. It's a multi-stage, sub-maximal test for estimating VO2. And I have a feeling this is going to be a video where people might have some comments or questions. Uh, this test, from what I've seen in the past with students, gets a little tricky. It gets a little confusing. There's a lot of figuring out where to go next with what data. So I'll try to address all that during this video. Um, I'll have the camera on and off at certain points so you can see what's on the slides. Uh, I've really been trying not to do a lot of slides with these videos. I've been trying to do mostly on the whiteboard. I think today for this particular example, I think the PowerPoint's just a little bit easier. If it's not, if you guys don't like it, let me know. We can do another video on the YMCA and see if we can make it uh, a little easier to understand. All right, so this is where we're going to start. This slide I'm giving to you as this is the protocol. This is from an old lab manual that I've used in class before, but as far as I know, the protocol has not changed. Uh, so, you know, when you're looking through this video, you can you bring this up, you can pause it, you can try to take a screenshot of this or whatever helps you. There are a few things I want to point out that are quite different from when we did the ACSM's, um, or sorry, the A-strand rhyming uh, bike test, which was uh, also a sub-maximal test, but it was a uh, single stage in, in nature. This is multi-stage, meaning we are changing our workloads throughout. So right here. It's multi-stage, it's still a sub-maximal VO2 test. It's not a maximal VM2 test. And that's something I'll go over in another video, the difference between maximal and sub-maximal. Workloads will increase. Uh, we need three minute, they're three minute stages. Uh, we are looking for a steady state heart rate, which is usually defined as less than five beats in between two separately measured heart rates, and I'll show you those. The heart rates must be between within 110 and 85% of the subject's maximal age predicted heart rate, which is different from the A strand where I think it's, I forget, maybe 125 and then 75%. Don't quote me on that. I forget off the top of my head. Uh, if you were actually doing the protocol, you would do heart rates, you would do our, uh, ratings of perceived exertion, you would do blood pressures. Okay, I'll always palpate at the radial pulse. We really do not teach carotid pulses anymore. Again, in between 110 and 85%. Here is the protocol. Here's a couple tricky things. You would warm, you would warm the person up at three minutes at 150 kilogram meters per minute. All right. Depending on what the heart rate is after that warm up will dictate where we go with our workloads. And I will show you that um, in, in just a second. Okay, so look at this bolded point here. If during the warm up, if their heart rate is greater than 110, then that warm up is considered the first stage. If not, what you basically would do is you would do another three minutes at a workload of 150 to see if the heart rate increases. So point number six tells you uh, how to find uh, steady states. And then uh, there on and there on the number eight, I will show you on the graph uh, how to do as well. All right, here I am again. So like I said on the previous slide with the protocol, maybe you have a screenshot, you have the protocol in front of you, you can use. If at the end of the warm up, the heart rate was greater than 110, then that counts as your first stage. If not, then you will have the work rate at 150 kgms per minute or 0.5 kilograms if you're actually putting the weights on the Monarch cycles. Um, and 50 RPM, we want to make sure that our cadence is 50 RPM. That's crucial because if that changes, then our, our total work rate changes. And that formula I will show you in another video. If at the end of the first stage, all right, if the heart rate is less than 80, then this is where you would go for the second stage. You would go up to 750. If at the end of the first stage, your heart rate is in between 90 to 100, this is where you would go. And you so on and so forth, all right? If the heart rate at the end of the second stage was less than 80, move up to 900. If the heart rate at the end of the second stage 
all right, is above 100 and we started here, for example, at the 750, then we would back off to 450. All right, hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Okay, so you basically just go by the heart rates. So let's see. let's do something very logical. At the end of 150, our heart rate's uh, 100. All right, so we'll go up to 450. At the end of this stage, our heart rate is 110. Okay, then we would continue actually at 450 and we would just keep going. I have a full example uh, that I will show you in just a minute. You can take a screenshot of this as well. Uh, this came right out of the ACSM's guidelines for exercise testing and prescription. I believe the ninth edition maybe? Maybe the ninth or the, the tenth? Uh, but again, I don't believe this has changed. I don't believe it has changed. So I think we're good. I think we're okay there. All right, I'll keep the video uh, going for you guys. So here is a sample YMCA protocol submaximal bike test. This was not one that was actually conducted. These were just numbers that I threw out there. Now I'm giving you these three uh, things to keep in mind over here, all right? Because we must have our cadence must be 50 RPMs as far as how fast we're cycling. Heart rate must be between 110 and 85% heart rate max. And we must have a steady state heart rate in two consecutive, that means back to back stages. Now, let's run through this. We have a John Doe, he or she is 30 years old and they weigh 174 and a half or 79.5 kilograms. Always make sure you get your metric measurements, your kilograms, you're going to need it. Uh, we have some resting numbers here, 60 heart rate, 110 over 70 blood pressure, pretty good. Pretty good. So we do 220 minus 30. That gives us 190. All right. For uh, age predicted max heart rate. Now I should say disclaimer. I should have said this in the beginning. There are a certain set of rules that tell us if we should terminate a test early due to a blood pressure, heart rate, RPE, uh, signs or symptoms of cardiovascular events. There, there's a whole uh, a set of those in the ACSM's guidelines. This example that I'm showing you here is assuming everything went fine with no problems. Everything went fine, no problems. We get our target heart rate 85% max, 161 and a half. All right, so we've got that. Now, our target, let's see, we warm them up 150. Here are our numbers. Now, our heart rate is below 110. So that means that this does not count as a first stage. This is just a warm up. So we're going to continue at 150 for three more minutes. Get two more heart rate measurements. All right, now this is interesting. We have a steady state heart rate. Okay, we're within four beats. However, it's below 110. So we can't use that as one of our actual steady state heart rates that we're going to plot because it's below 110. So what are we gonna do? We're just gonna follow our tree diagram, which if you have in front of you, it should say, because our heart rate is 100, we're going to move up to 450. All right, get some more numbers, 450. So we have a 120 and a 126. Very close, but not a steady state. So we're going to move on. The tree diagram should say that we stay uh, at 450. So we have a 130 and a 134. That's a steady state. So that's good. That's a steady state heart rate. So now let's see where we're going after that. Tree diagram says we should go up to 600. The tree diagram is that one that says if heart rate is this, uh, then go to this workload. All right, and we get a couple more uh, vitals, heart rates, blood pressures. Uh, and by the way, all these blood pressures, they look good. None of these are indicators for stopping a test or anything like that. Same with the heart rates. And here we have another steady state heart rate. Now, this is an easy example because here in workload three is a steady state heart rate that is between 110 and 85% heart rate max. And in our next workload, this would be a consecutive, right? Two consecutive back to back. We also have heart rates that are within 110 and 85% heart rate max, and they're within five beats of each other. So at this point, we actually have all the data we need. We can terminate this test and we can get this uh, person to cool down. I didn't throw cool down numbers in here because we don't use them in calculation. Uh, you should do 
at least a five minute cool down if you want something objective during a cool down uh, the heart rate should come down probably at least 20 beats of what it was uh, at the peak uh, or even better if you can get it below 100 that's even better all right as long as those numbers are coming down as long as those numbers are coming down now let's plot the workload and heart rate nearest to 120 uh nearest to 110 all right that's in the second workload now as i'm doing this an interesting point here i'm not sure if this has to be a steady state or not um i don't believe so that wouldn't make sense to me so we're going to do our 120 here at 450 and workload and heart rate nearest to 85 percent max all right that's this one up here 154 at 600 so those are the big numbers that we need we can now move on to the graph which i'm going to show you so that we can plot and calculate vo2 okay here we are again so the graph i've already filled everything in it just was easier that way because of the way the graph had to be imported as a picture so i couldn't edit on the fly i had to do it all up front so i what i've done is i've brought all our information in i didn't bring the age of the weight well i brought the weight in kilograms i didn't bring the weight in pounds because uh, we really don't need it and we don't need the age unless you're correcting which we're not going to do uh 79 and a half kilograms here is uh age predicted heart rate max um resting heart rate resting blood pressure ending heart rate and bp first workload heart rate second workload heart rate all right which actually oh yep so first stage where we got a heart rate second stage third stage fourth stage okay so first workload heart rate used remember was 120 that was the one that was closest to 110 so I'm going to go and plot that right here 120 at look down here workload in kilogram meters per minute 150 120 plot a little red dot good all right second uh, workload used was 154 at 600 so what I'm going to do is find 600 kgms a minute all right go up until i find 154 plot right there good sorry about that third thing i'm gonna do oh actually let me take a step back sorry the very first thing i i, I did do was put this big bolded black line where our age predicted heart rate max was we'll need that um to get the intersect all right so sorry about that so we plotted the workload and heart rate closest to 110 We've plotted the workload and heart rate closest to uh, the age predicted heart rate max. And now what I'm going to do is I just draw this blue line through those until it intersects with that age predicted heart rate max line. Not the 85%. Okay. Not the 85% um, number, but the age predicted max number which for this individual was 190. draw a red dot where those intersect then drop a line straight down and they, here we go right here max o2 in liters per minute so that's an absolute representation 2.4 uh, liters per minute which if you needed to get that into relative what you would do is you would take 2.4 multiply it by a thousand to get you into milliliters that would be 2400 and then you would divide that by the individual's body weight in kilograms which i didn't do beforehand so i'm going to do it right now on the calculator so you guys can see what it actually would be it would be 30.18 so as i look at these numbers that actually makes a, a good amount of sense to me i would i would assume a 30 year old individual and it does matter if they're if they're male or female right because uh, males are able to achieve a higher uh, vo2 that's something you'll just you'll want to know for your exams 
so, but you know, for the average person, that about makes sense. Uh, I would like that VO2 to be a little bit higher, but it's certainly not bad by any means. And that's, the, you know, that's assuming we ran a perfect test, a, a, a perfect, perfect test. Assuming the person who was taking the heart rates was perfect at it. Um, I don't recommend uh, using wearables um, unless you have somebody with a very regular steady heart rate, um, which most people have. Very fit athletes may not though. They may have something called a sinus arrhythmia, which gives you irregular uh, cardiac cycles which are based off of the breathing pattern uh, which is actually which is actually normal that's not really a bad thing it shows up as irregular on an ekg but it's not actually such a bad thing uh, i do i do recommend radial pulse um right here okay get really good at radial pulse that'll give you your best idea um, so I hope this was helpful as far as um, the YMCA, how to plot everything, how to get your VO2s. Uh, and then from there, you can take those and you can interpret, you can correct for age. You can say, okay, uh, we need to work on this, um, do whatever we need to do. So let me know if this worked out. If not, I can try to whiteboard it or I can try to come up with something else. All right.